Yeah, well, one of the, the concerns that comes up around methane release in the Arctic is that there could be large amounts that are released very quickly, and that could lead to dramatic global warming. Is that something you you expect or, or see in that as well? Not, not really. No. Um, so there are certain things, certain processes in nature that is susceptible to large transient events, mm -hmm. uh, such as earthquakes, uh, shelf failure, and so on, uh, tipping points. Yeah. H however, the question is, what would cause a tipping point in the Arctic? And it's really hard to envisage that. You know, one might hypothesize, uh, and this I'm setting up a straw man, uh, just to give you a foreshadowing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, well, my hypothesize that you hit a certain temperature, and at above that temperature, suddenly the methane is going to start escaping very rapidly. But the reality is that whatever t critical or tipping point temperature you might identify, on any year, it goes way, it, it r radically passes in both directions that temperature because climate in the Arctic is extremely variable. Uh, mm -hmm. In the uh, East Siberian Arctic Sea, um, they tend to have, during their 90 days of uh, ice-free oceans, like 80 days that are a force 5 gale, or, or, or maybe a little bit less. It's, it's something like 80% of the time in the Arctic, there's a massive storm. Mm -hmm. So it's always getting like we've just experienced here around the U.S. in the last week, really hot and really cold. And so if there were a tipping point, these uh, storm changes or very radical seasonal changes, there are also significant changes driven by El Nino uh, that are uh, evident in the satellite data, mm -hmm. they would have tipped it already, and we would have noticed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I, I, you know, it's... I mean, it's kind of dramatic to think of a Lake Kivu type of methane bomb. But Lake Kivu is a really unique system, though fascinating, um, in which there's volcanic methane that goes into very stable water at the bottom of a, I don't know, it's a six or 800 meter deep lake, and slowly builds up the methane concentration in the water um, till it becomes unstable because if you dissolve methane in water the water becomes lighter and it overturns mm -hmm. and there is certainly some indications this isn't a proven that every four or five thousand years the methane gets catastrophically released and creates a five to fifteen kiloton explosion in the area Wow. Um, so you end up with five or ten cubic kilometers of methane kind of released very rapidly, and then it auto-ignites in the atmosphere, mm. which would certainly be impressive to observe from space or a long way away, but rather devastating to the very large communities that are around it. Mm -hmm. However, to get that kind of a stability is just not possible in the ocean because the ocean has always has currents and things are always moving. It's not static water, even under the ice. Mm. So again, it's, it's really, so I always look at it more along the lines of the little drip, 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 which adds up when you have enough drips going on all over the place okay. to kind of slowly push everything in the wrong direction. Mm. And, you know, there is, um, you know, there are a number of reasons that methane is, aside from the one obvious one, which is that as a species we've shown we can regulate it. And not only can we regulate it, but we can regulate it by applying appropriate market incentives, um, which, again, is not true for many different uh, problems. Uh, certainly the uh, some of, uh, you know, the... Mar Pollution trading credits has not been the most effective right. in right. terms of overall uh, 
decrease of emissions, the carbon trading scheme that was released with enormous fanfare in Europe. No one seems to mention it anymore because it seemed more like a giant subsidy to industry mm -hmm. rather than a effective mechanism to reduce emissions. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, in the two cases that I mentioned before, the market mechanism actually did work. Uh, and so one could imagine, and this would be if uh, President Biden called me up tomorrow morning, or president-elect, and said, what do we do about methane, Dr. Leifer? And I would say, well, we should make zero interest loans to the oil and gas industry to be used specifically to stop their leaks and to be paid back with the money they get from selling that methane. Mm, okay. Uh, you know, so the question is, why don't they fix their leaks? And they certainly do to some extent, but it takes cash up front to fix the leaks. You've got to replace infrastructure that maybe wasn't scheduled for replacement for another 10 years. You've got to move up all these other kinds of maintenance schedules, and there's a cost with that. And then they look at the cost of selling the gas, and they say, well, that's not going to pay me back, me being the company, CEO, mm -hmm. for 15 years, and I won't be here then, so I don't give a damn. Right, right. On, the, on the other hand, if it was to pay back the federal government over 15 years and therefore has no effect on negative effect on the bottom line or maybe half of the profits from selling it could be shared with the federal government and the company, then suddenly you don't have the resistance of industry, which means that we could make progress. Mm. So because ultimately CO2 has to be addressed, so which means that ultimately as a species we have to grow up. And growing up takes time. <laughs> and we largely seem to have not bothered to grow up despite having time. So what's needed is further time so we can actually make that transition. Mm -hmm. And so I, I look at things as what society or humanity really needs now is an extra decade or two to grow up. <laughs> <laughs> well, and so that's... how do we give ourselves an extra decade? You know, and... Uh, one of the, the areas is attempting to, because we're fighting what's happening in the Arctic. So if we want to make any progress on methane, which has a larger effect on the radiative balance of the atmosphere than CO2, we have to cut our methane emissions faster than the Arctic is increasing its. Mm. It's kind of a race. And so different ways of doing that are to you know, a lot of it, I would just say, is to properly price methane and oil and gas so that you disincentivize production of hydrocarbons that's more likely to release methane and you incentivize production of hydrocarbons that's not, while separately attempting to address the CO2, which is moving to sustainable energy for powering society. Um, but that's a, a really big problem in that there's been an awful lot of effort, words, political capital spent in that direction and really large investments, relatively speaking, in which pretend that I said that with lots of sarcasm. <laughs> but there has been lots of investments in that regard, and yet pretty much all of the renewable energy to date in like the last 20 or 30 years has simply covered much of the growth in energy usage of the planet. Mm. We, as a species, have really not retired any fossil fuel energy production, despite all the investments in uh, solar and wind and so on. You're right, you're right. And so, again, this is a is clear, you know, and again, I know um, if you watch the news, it's very clear that the center of the globe is the U.S. Um, 
But the globe is actually a sphere and doesn't have a center except somewhere down in the core where it's molten rock. And the reality is the U.S. is only one of many actors. Mm-hmm. And some one could easily argue we're not a dominant actor either. Mm-hmm. And so this, again, uh, speaks to the need for you know these kind of large treaties, but they haven't worked very well either because the atmospheric CO2 keeps climbing on a nice straight line, which really means that the incentives aren't there. And so in the treaty have largely been sticks. Don't do this. We all agree not to do this. And then at the end of the day, it's obvious many agreed but did not follow through. Mm-hmm. And so as a species, what's needed is to not just have the sticks, but also have the carrots. Um, <laughs> and which uh, to try to incentivize uh, shifts and changes. And, you know, this is not a, it's clearly non trivial, uh, but it's also clear that what's happened hasn't succeeded. Uh, I used to think back when I was a college student in the 80s that people will take this seriously when tens of thousands of people a year are dying from climate change related problems. <laughs> we blew past that number by orders of magnitude and no one seems to nothing changes and therefore it's not being taken seriously at some point it will you know at some point it's clear that the money could be made out of thin air to make it happen in the way it was just recently made out of thin air for fairly fairly um suspicious uh, application during the COVID crisis. Yeah. You know, vast sums can kind of be created at the click of a button, and somehow the world doesn't end when that happens. Mm-hmm. Uh, so at some point, these issues could be uh, addressed. Uh, it's clear that uh, the technology could be there to do so. Uh, what's lacking is in the incentive, the will, politically and, and otherwise. So back to methane, the globe needs time. Okay. And so uh, one of the, there's, there are some things that could be done on a geoengineering uh, for the Arctic. Um, they're not trivial, and certainly um, no one is talking about them in a serious way, as in serious, I mean, putting real money up to developing them. Mm-hmm. Uh, the research that I uh, in, you know, have done suggests uh, that one approach that could work is to focus on that warm water current and kind of try to um, stop it mm. from a uh, chain, which could potentially be done if we were to basically make that part of the coast of Norway and Murmansk uh, much cloudier and and so on. But this is, you know, really big ideas. It's not something that uh, some billionaire is going to fund out of their pocket because it's more than that. Mm -hmm. And it would involve also working with those people who have all the oil and gas on their side of the border, Russians, Mm-hmm. Um, which is something that we're not that good at these days, uh, even right. though it is one planet. And so uh, given geoengineering seems to be uh, something for the far future, uh, we need time. <laughs> and again, this comes back to there are quite a few low-hanging fruit that could be implemented to reduce the human emission part of the methane uh, to cancel out the Arctic and also the other feedbacks in the tropics uh, and wetlands, which as wetlands get warmer, the bacteria go faster, you get more methane. Right. Well, so if we address the methane that human beings produce directly through industrial activity and extraction and all of that, um, you're saying it would cancel... 
Sorry? Get 20 years, we could get another. Okay. I mean, basically, uh, it was done before, and it stabilized methane for a period of 15 years that purely coincidentally uh, co co um, was a period where the climate also stabilized. Mm. And if you look at global temperatures and so on, uh, and extreme weather, they've largely really become a problem since around 2006 or seven, which is when methane started increasing. Mm. And so as I had noted before, and it's much more so, on a 20-year time scale, methane affects the radiative balance of the Earth more than carbon dioxide. On 10-year time scales, which is the appropriate time scale for methane because that's its lifetime, this is even much stronger. That means any global climate change-related weather that we're seeing now is being driven by methane, not CO2. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. It's really simple. And yeah. it's on the IPCC, uh, I think it was 2007, uh, figure 2.11. On one side, they have methane with a 100-year uh, scale that everyone cited. And on the other side, they have it on a 20-year time scale. Not controversial. It just uh, people say, well, climate is long-term, so we have to do 100-year. Like, but the climate changes that we're experiencing, that could lead and will lead to extinction, which is one way. Uh, are occurring on timescales not of centuries, but decades and less. And so they're being driven by, therefore, something with a timescale response of decades, which is methane. Mm. Well, you see why I felt that that initial decision to focus on CO2 was a strategic mistake of the environmental movement. They were overly optimistic that we could all sing Kumbaya and change the world <laughs> overnight. <laughs> yeah, uh, a lot of people f still feel that way, I believe, unbelievably. It's, it's kind of hard to imagine how they could feel that way still. But, um, <laughs> well, so this is interesting. I mean, I've heard so much. I know it's very alarmist, but this idea of a, like a methane bomb, you know, this idea of a giant release of methane, and that would just dramatically rise temperature, uh, you know, make temperatures rise globally and all of this. And, I mean, what you said is... I mean, it's it's kind of it's, it's gone in a different direction actually it's more like a slow release but I, I'm assuming more release over it's a, time. It's a slow and accelerating. Okay. Uh, because as things warm, now the heat spreads further and you have more sea ice that goes away and more. There are many many positive feedbacks right. that lead to acceleration hmm. uh, over time. Okay. Um, the <laughs> I mean, it's not that it's impossible that there is a methane time bomb somewhere on the Arctic. There could be, you know, a giant cavern of a, a couple of hundred cubic kilometers of methane that will suddenly escape. Mm -hmm. And we don't know about it uh, yet, you know, and we could find out about it that way, or the Russians could find it and then drive the price of natural gas down to a penny as they produce it. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, on the flip side, it's unlikely, uh, given that oil and gas reservoirs, may, you know, similar, you just don't see that kind of uh, geological structures around the planet. Right. Um, so it could more like, you know, the most likely way it could happen is with a volcanic eruption. Hmm. Um, some volcanoes, only a few, do release methane, but they also release so much ash that they also tend to have a cooling effect on the globe, mm -hmm. potentially significantly. And so that's where you kind of get these massive eruptions um, that can change the climate. But it's it's hard to really envisage the conditions necessary for that kind of a really rapid change to exist, uh, you know, unless something like there's an unknown vast quantity of methane right under the Greenland ice sheet, and mm -hmm. then the ice sheet 
just kind of massively slides off, and then it all comes up. But right. it's unlike it's it's not completely impossible, but it's really speculative and not based on our current understanding of geology, mm-hmm. which really means it probably won't happen. Mm-hmm. And the worry shouldn't be about the Arctic and a massive release, just the continuous steady deluge that just slowly grows and grows to the point at which there is nothing that we can do on the anthropogenic side to cancel it. 